Good evening, and welcome to this special edition of UW Now. I'm Sarah Schutt, the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and we're so glad to have you here tonight. You know, one of the strongest connections that UW alumni have to campus and to each other is around traditions. We share so many time-honored Badger traditions, and when we can't be together, those traditions become even more important to us to help create a sense of community. In just a couple of days, we'll be welcoming into alumnihood nearly 7,000 new Badgers in the class of 2020. And so commencement seemed like the perfect time for us to take a deeper look at our special Badger traditions. We have a great lineup of people to help us do that tonight. In just a little bit, we are going to be visiting with members of the class of 1970 and the class of 2020. But first, we are going to hear from my friend and colleague, Jeff Wendorf. Jeff, hello, welcome. Hi, Sarah, thanks for having me. Yes, it's great to have you. Now, for those of you who don't know Jeff, which are probably very, very few people, Jeff is a 1982 grad and a proud alumnus of the UW Marching Band. And he has worked at the Wisconsin Alumni Association since 1989. He is well known as a thorough UW expert and historian and really, I cannot imagine anybody who is better prepared to share with us the backstory about UW traditions than Jeff. We are in for a treat. But I have to ask you, Jeff, now you and I have worked together for almost 20 years, and I, you are a vault of endless amounts of wonderful information about UW. How did you come by all that information, and how did you get yourself to be an expert on UW history? Well, thanks, Sarah. Um, Really, it all began back when I was managing chapters, and I developed this backup presentation just in case any of our speakers canceled at the time. And so uh, that was on traditions, and it's just sort of grown from there. But let me say, first off, I'm really not a historian. Uh, my study isn't peer-reviewed, and my evidence is simply based on my own observations. But I have spent almost 40 years now on campus, 30 of those with the WAA, and have absorbed and experienced a lot of traditions and really have worked with a lot of well-regarded mentors like Mike Lecrone and former Vice Chancellor Art Hovey, who used to give a presentation on traditions that mine is sort of loosely based on. Well, that's great. Well, Jeff, let's hear about some of these special Badger traditions. Great. Yeah, so um, there's so many traditions at the university, it'd be impossible to go through all of them, but I wanna talk about those traditions that I feel are the most enduring traditions. And I wanna do it in a framework uh, that really explains what a great tradition is. And I feel like in order to be an enduring and great tradition, there needs to be three conditions. The tradition needs to be authentic and not contrived. It needs to change with the times. It needs to have a home on campus or a group that preserves and honors and nurtures those traditions. So let me do that. Uh, so first off, let's talk about authenticity. Um, the Big Ten Conference, for instance, is the oldest conference with some of the greatest rivalries and uh, the first and the most rivalry trophies that represent those games. They represent pranks, folklores, and rich traditions and have many stories associated with them. But as we've added teams now to the Big Ten, uh, we have some designated rivalries and unimaginative trophies that are not inspired by traditions, but are inspired by meticulous marketing. So we know that uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota is the longest played rivalry since 1890. Uh, we've played uh, without interruption except for 1906. And we all know that Wisconsin plays Minnesota for the ax. The ax, though, was replaced by the original trophy, which is the slab of bacon. So from 1930 to 1943, the clubs traded a wooden paddle, you, as you can see here, with the word bacon written on both ends. Because if you won, it means that you brought home the bacon. You know, puns are great, right? Um, so uh, in 1943, the battle up in Minneapolis ended up having Minnesota come from behind. They won. Fans rushed the field. And in the confusion, 
the bacon trophy was lost. Um, and the teams decided to sort of take a pause before they introduced a new rivalry trophy. But in 1948, a group of UW former letter winners introduced the Paul Bunyan's Axe as the new replacement trophy. And at six feet long, the trophy resembles a type of implement that the you know, mythical lumberjack would have yielded, and actually is something that is uh, great for a 270 pound linebacker to yield as well. And it reflects really our universities, two universities, great forestry programs, and our state's logging heritage. Incidentally, uh, in 1994, with the renovation of Camp Randall Stadium, they actually found the Bacon Trophy and it was stored in, in a storage locker. And, for, and uh, unbeknownst to anybody, somebody had written onto the trophy the scores of the games going up until 1970. So we took home the bacon, we never gave it up. Uh, I think maybe a better example of authenticity though would be jump around. That's the great tradition that takes place between the third and fourth quarter of football games. It began back in 1993 football season where the men's swimming and diving team actually smuggled a megaphone and a disc man into the stadium and played the song to rile up sections O and P. A media start was actually on, on Saturday, October 10th, 1998, at the Badgers' homecoming game that year versus Purdue. And after no offensive points were scored in the third quarter, the Badgers' marketing agent in charge of sound piped in the song through the loudspeakers, and the fans and the players erupted, and it's become a tradition uh, for the last two decades. Uh, so today, actually, the jump around is a craze that probably, quite possibly has become the most popular Saturday tradition that we have in the state during the pandemic. I've also mentioned that traditions really need to change over time. So um, the best example I can give you of that is our own Bucky Badger. So we all know we're the Badger State, but I bet a lot of people don't know where that name comes from. And it actually comes from the first settlers in the state of Wisconsin were lead miners in the southwestern part of the state. And they built their homes, their temporary homes, into uh, tunnels on the side of the hillside and were known as Badger Boys or Badger. And the name eventually came to represent then the state itself. So when the university chose a mascot, it naturally became the badger. And Bucky's predecessor, seen here, was actually a real badger. But those cantankerous critters, they uh, escaped from the sideline, from their sideline handlers more than once. And uh, after a couple of trips to the ER, they decided to retire the real badger and swapped it out with a small raccoon in its place, which really wasn't a good substitute at all. Uh, Bucky, though, came to life in 1949, and it's pictured here as a paper mache head that was worn by a male cheerleader, Bill Sagal, uh, from Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And the name, naming contest followed the next year, and the, the mascot's official moniker then was decided on Buckingham U. Badger. And as you can see, the costume has evolved since then, becoming the lovable, grinning Bucky we all know and love, but keeping the same Badger pride and spirited nature. And finally, great traditions have to have a home or have a group on campus, as I said, that nurtures those. And there's not a better example of that than the organization I was a member of while I was in school, and that's the UW Marching Band. We know there's a ton of traditions that the U University Marching Band uh, preserves to this day, from the fifth quarter to wearing the hats backwards and all the great songs, and the most prominent of all of them, of course, is our school fight song, On Wisconsin. So first off, that statement, On Wisconsin, actually comes from a Civil War battle, the Battle of Missionary Ridge on November 25th in 1863 during the Chattanooga campaign. There was an 18-year-old lieutenant, Arthur MacArthur, who actually was the father of Douglas MacArthur, uh, who inspired the Wisconsin 24th Regiment by seizing and planting the regimental flag on Missionary Ridge at a particularly critical moment, shouting, on Wisconsin. And for these actions, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. So fast forward 46 years, 
uh, on Wisconsin was composed by W.T. Purdy and was introduced to Wisconsin's football fight song in 1909 at homecoming. So Purdy was going to enter the melody in a competition actually for Minnesota's fight song. But his roommate, who was a former UW student, Carl Beck, said, no, that's too good for Minnesota, Bill, and convinced him to dedicate the song to the Badger Football Club with the famous lyrics on Wisconsin. And today, on Wisconsin has become the most popular fight song in the country with some 2,500 schools adopting it as their fight song, and John Philip Sousa regarded it as the finest of all marching songs. So Thank there's a few good traditions. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. I think my favorite part of, of what you shared, and I always learn something, but I love the fact that Minnesota both lost the bacon and they lost the best song. So I think we are we are definitely on top there. Now, I know that you are so well steeped in, in this history, but you have to have a special badger tradition yourself. What What is that? Yeah. I, well, I would think my favorite tradition is probably everybody's favorite tradition, and that is our time-honored varsity. I mean, I think there is nothing better than to be shoulder to shoulder with other Badger fans in Camp Randall and um, and sway and sing varsity. It's a very poignant moment for all of us. Um, incidentally, the thing that I think really makes it, though, great is that hand-waving uh, that it was instituted in 1934 by then-band director uh, Ray Dvorak. And actually, like a lot of good traditions, he, he borrowed it. Uh, so while he was a band director at Illinois, he observed the Pennsylvania students singing their alma mater after a loss for, to Illinois and kept that in the back of his mind. And then at a uh, ceremony that was honoring then President Glenn Frank, he cued the band up to wave their hands. And we've been doing it ever since. It caught on with crowds and we've been doing it ever since. And it is one of those just great, wonderful traditions that I hope to God we can be doing uh, sometime very soon. <laughs> no doubt, that will <laughs> that first varsity all back together is going to feel feel really special for everybody. Yeah. Um, now, Jeff, th these have been great examples of UW traditions, but I noticed that most of them have been, or all of them have been, from athletics, which is a wonderful mm -hmm. thing to celebrate. What about some? UW traditions that that aren't related as much to athletics. Yeah, well, it's probably natural that a lot of our traditions are around athletics. That is the point in time when we're together as a Badger family um, in Camp Randall, in the Cole Center. Um, so it makes sense. And in fact, uh, the great uh, football coach, Paul Bear Bryant said, it's really hard to rally around an English class. But there are four traditions that really aren't associated with Badger sports and are probably our greatest traditions, and they're really more than traditions. They are our guiding principles and values for the University of Wisconsin. So one of the longest and deepest traditions surrounding the university is the Wisconsin idea that really signifies there's an obligation, uh, that the university has an obligation to improve the condition around the world. And synonymous with Wisconsin for more than a century, this idea has become really, as I said, kind of a guiding philosophy uh, for the university and for university outreach efforts in Wisconsin and throughout the world. So the genius of the Wisconsin idea is often attributed in the slide before to uh, former President Charles Van Heys, who in 1904 speech declared, I shall never be content until the beneficent influence of the university reaches every single home in the state. And as president, he saw the creation of the extension division, uh, which oversaw summer courses and short course, and he brought the university's knowledge to every city in the state. He also took advantage at that time of his friendship with the governor, who was Robert LaFollette, who actually was his roommate while he was in, in school. And he helped forge ties between the university and the state government. And during their time together, uh, the faculty experts consulted with legislators, uh, imagine that, right, uh, to draft many influential and groundbreaking laws, including the nation's first uh, workers' compensation, uh, legislation on tax reforms, and the public uh, regulation of utilities, and actually the, the blueprint that became our Social Security Act. So now over time, however, that idea, which was synonymous with uh, public policy, has 
really uh, come to signify broadly more the university's commitment to public service. And today, in the spirit of the Wisconsin idea, the university continues to seek and extend its influence beyond the boundaries of the campus. And at WAA, we really feel that our alumni are the embodiment of the Wisconsin idea, taking what they learn in the classroom and applying it into their businesses and into their communities. And if you visit Alumni Park, you'll be able to really learn a lot about uh, what our alumni have done over the years and contributed in the framework of the Wisconsin idea. The second one is really our Magna Carta, Carta for the university, sifting and winnowing. And we, when we use that phrase, sifting and winnowing, uh, we're referring to a tradition of academic freedom that goes back to 1894 in a statement uh, from the Board of Regents. The regents at that time were asked to uh, censure Professor Richard Ely, who was accused of being a socialist and uh, pro-union activities and uh, teaching some uh, radical ideas at the university. But to his defense came then President Charles Adams, who was quoted, you can see the plaque there, of whatever be the limitations, the trammel uh, inquiry elsewhere, we believe that the great state university of Wisconsin should ever uh, ever encourage a continual sifting and winnowing by which it, the truth shall be found. Um, so that was emblazoned on the side of Bascom Hill and is there today uh, by the class of 1910. And their statement really has inspired generations of students, faculty, and staff since then, and is often used to emphasize the strong value that our university places on individual and academic freedom. And it really has inspired many of our students to be able to find their voice at the university and take that into their careers. So the, the final two I'm gonna talk about uh, don't have a plaque dedicated to them or a park, but they're really part of our Badger DNA. And the first one uh, has to do with our students and faculty and staff that have that vibrant spirit and enthusiasm. And the fact that we believe life outside of the academic setting of the classroom is equally as important as uh, to the university community, uh, which wholeheartedly embraces fun, play, and inspired goofiness. So um, I think a better way to say that, Mike Leckron always says this, is that Wisconsin students and alumni take what they do seriously, but they don't take themselves seriously. Um, and the best example I can give you is a time when I was actually on campus um, in the late 70s and early 80s, when there was an absurdist and infamous pail and shovel party led by uh, Jim, Lam uh, Jim Malone and Leon Varjan, uh, and they were elected to the Wisconsin Student Association. Uh, they were called the pail and shovel party. And uh, they were named for the campaign promise to convert the UW's budget into pennies uh, for the students to collect on the library mall with pails and shovels. Uh, and so they pulled a lot of pranks over this time. And uh, in the winter of 1979, they erected this giant uh, replica of the Statue of Liberty's head and torch on Lake Mendota, a stunt which made it kind of seem like Lady Liberty was emerging from the lake's bottom. And they also put a flock of a thousand pink flamingos on Bascom Hill in the fall of 1979. And the story in the Badger Herald was that they uh, that they gave to the Badger Herald as they got caught in a hurricane and they were deposited on Bascom Hill. And within hours, most of the birds were stolen and appeared on the lawns throughout the city. Well, uh, fast forward to today, uh, at our winter carnival in February, we now still have a replica of Lady Liberty on Lake Mendota, like you can see there. And during homecoming, uh, Fill the Hill is a day-long uh, uh, campaign, a uh, giving campaign that the foundation sponsors. And if you give a gift on that day, you get a flamingo on ba Bascom Hill. And uh, students are still stealing those and putting them into their dorm rooms. Uh, finally, that uh, the other part of our Badger DNA is really our being part of a Badger family. And like a family, we take care of one another and we feel like we're better together. So this idea is really rooted 
in kind of our Midwestern sensibility, we call ourselves, you know, Wisconsinite. We, we pride ourselves on our friendly and open atmosphere. And there is this pervasive sense of value and hard work and a lack of artifice and arrogance amongst all of our alumni. Additionally, the real sheer size of our campus community, which offers that richness experience, that diversity of opinions and that abundance of opportunity um, is sometimes hard to navigate. And we need each other. Uh, we learned that early on while we're on campus. And so we all believe that we are better together. We're better as, uh, as a group and uh, we are uh, there to really help each other out. And I think the best example uh, of that Badger family is on display every year at commencement. And what I love about commencement is it just embraces everything that I talked about today. It's, it's a tradition that it changes over time. It's changing greatly this year. Uh, it's, it has its home in the chancellor's office, which makes sure that built into commencement, uh, we highlight the Wisconsin idea and the sifting and winnowing. Uh, and also the, we're going to hear from the senior class council. They are also one of the caretakers of our commencement. And they really are there to sort of keep it authentic, provide that student perspective, and provide that sense of spirited goofiness. So there you have it. Those are what I think are the four greatest traditions, but more than traditions. They're, they're part of our guiding principles at the university and part of our values. Jeff, thank you. And I love you're welcome. I love that you ended uh, your presentation with commencement. Yeah. And you and I know that uh, there's a, a really special role that the Wisconsin Alumni Association plays in commencement by creating a connection between the graduating class and the 50th year reunion class. Yeah. And you work really closely with that program. Can you just say a, a word or two about the role of the 50th reunion class and, and their connection to commencement? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So. Um, this has developed over time and uh, we, we realized that a lot of the 50 year class, when they come back to campus, they wanna interact with students. And we thought the best way to do that is to have them interact with some of our brightest and best students. And so we, uh, we built this partnership with the senior class council. Uh, they have a class gift, we have a class gift, uh, they have commencement to plan for and we have this reunion. So uh, we've brought them together through their meetings. It's a great, sort of uh, uh, opportunity for them to be able to share ideas back and forth. Uh, and the uh, 50 year class also has, uh, has a very special role in commencement or has had a very special role in commencement. And that is they hand out to each one of the graduates our 50 year pin, the special 50 year, uh, not the 50 year pin, the alumni <laughs> pin. When, when, you graduate, <laughs> when, when, you, when you celebrate your 50 year reunion, you get the 50 year pin, but they hand out their alumni pin, and they lead out the procession into uh, the stadium. So it's a great, wonderful moment uh, that we've been able to be uh, build in one of those great traditions. Thanks, Jeff. Well, we're really we're really fortunate because our next guest, in addition to being a member of the class of 1970, is actually also a member of the reunion planning committee and uh, has been able to experience some of those, but not quite all of those traditions. I would love to introduce now Keith White. And uh, Keith is, um, he has two degrees from UW-Madison, as mentioned, his undergrad in 1970. In addition, Keith served for a long time as the associate director and interim director of the UW Office of Admissions. And so he has some special insights into traditions as well. Welcome, Keith. Thanks for being here. Well, I'm delighted to be here. I'm, um, I'm honored that you would have me on the program. And so, yes, um, traditions are important. And uh, every tradition that Jeff mentioned, I, uh, I, I feel fondly, uh, fondly uh, in my mind, uh, memories of, of all of them. I still missed up, uh, missed up when, uh, when I hear varsity being played. But you know, the best part of varsity being played is to see the fans from the opposing team teams looking at us as we're leaving, <laughs> as Jeff suggested. They just look and shake their heads and say, they're all doing it, man. They're all doing it. Uh, I love okay. that. I do too. Tell us about some of the traditions that were popular when you were on campus in the late 60s. 
Yeah, uh, well, Jeff talked about the biggies. Uh, I'll talk about some, maybe some of the counterculture things that were going on that, uh, that some of us like to remember. There was a fire escape behind Science Hall, which was a gigantic tube from the top floor of that building. It was about three feet in diameter and it went down at an angle. And if there had been a fire in the building, everybody was supposed to leap into this tube and, uh, uh, and, and descend out of the building. Well, if uh, things got a little dull on a Friday night or a Saturday night and you were looking for fun, you could sneak into Science Hall and you could climb the stairs and you could find the entrance. It was a secret, but we all knew it. Uh, you could find the entrance to that uh, to that tube and you could slide down that thing. So that was uh, that, that was a, a major tradition for, uh, for quite a while. The tube's gone, can't do it anymore. Another tradition that lasted not for very long, but was brought on by the Madison Police Department, which decided that they were going to put an end to jaywalking across State Street. State Street was a traffic street back then. And uh, in uh, uh, the course of a, of a Friday night or a Saturday night when one wanted to uh, to go from the University Avenue area over to the State Street area to partake of social or uh, other events, uh, students would walk in mass across the street. The police would try to stop this and they would actually issue tickets to us. And so what we would do would be to line up uh, for a block and a half and everybody would walk across the street at the same time, thus befuddling the police. There were only two or three of them there that were trying to control the jaywalkers. And we would walk back and forth and back and forth uh, to see how many of us could, uh, uh, could garner a, a, a ticket for jaywalking. Needless to say, that tradition didn't last very long. And the other one I'll bring up, and I think some of my classmates will remember this, uh, when the humanities building was being uh, being built, there was a uh, a big plywood fence along State Street uh, to to keep the construction site site secure. And of course, being uh, being students that don't take themselves very seriously but are serious about what they do, uh, some of the best artwork on campus, uh, some of it erotic, some of it funny, some of it uh, is quite profound would show up on, uh, on that, uh, that plywood fence that stretched from the University Club all the way up to, uh, to Park Street. That went on for quite a while uh, and actually carried on a condition that started several gener or a couple of generations before when a professor known as Wild Bill Keekover, uh, who was a popular economics professor, uh, encouraged his students to do the same thing on a similar plywood fence that was, uh, that was built along State Street. So we try to do things that, uh, that kind of bring the past into the, uh, into the present and carry them on into the future. And we had a lousy football team back then, so we had to have <laughs> other things to do. The, the traditions Jen ta Jeff, uh, Jeff talks about were ours too, but it was harder to do it then. And find other forms of entertainment. Well, as far as I know, none of the three traditions that you described still continue in that form um, on campus now. Uh, but interestingly, recently, a lot of parallels have been been made between the class of 1970 and the class of 2020, largely because of the unusual circumstances um, that disrupted the spring semester of the senior year. Can you remind us what was going on in the spring of 1970 and, and what was life like on campus at that time? Yeah, it was an interesting time. Uh, and it, 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 it really does bring one up to date with the, with the class of 2020 who are experiencing their difficulties. The, the, the difficulties that this class is experiencing happened almost instantaneously, whereas ours were the kinds of things that generated and festered over a number of years. Uh, we were a country back then with many social problems, uh, many issues that divided us along many lines, not just politically. Uh, and so while the current pandemic uh, hit quickly and changed how the university operated, uh, the university back then was under pressure as students were concerned about the Vietnam War. That was the biggie. Uh, those of us who were young men, of course, we were concerned about whether we were going to get drafted. We cherished our 2S student deferment. Uh, the university had uh, a, a relationship with the, secret, the selective service system that would send our class rank into them. Uh, and that would determine whether we were going to lose that deferment or not. There were protests. You can see the picture on the screen now. Uh, tear gas was, uh, was used to, uh, to break up these, uh, these demonstrations of students that were 
exercising their rights to free speech. There was a lot of controversy about the war. Uh, I remember very well, although the campus didn't close, uh, many, cancel, many classes were canceled. Even some of the schools and colleges on campus would shut down for a day or two. I remember walking out of Bascom Hall being escorted out by a member of the Madison Police Department dressed up in full riot gear. His concern was not that I was going to cause trouble, but he didn't want me to be hurt by what was going on outside. On the other hand, I remember walking out of the Memorial, uh, of the Memorial Library uh, just as a tear gas canister was rolled towards the, um, uh, the State Street door. Uh, to this day, when I talk about that, I can smell that tear gas uh, in, my, uh, uh, in my nose. But uh, there were other things going on. Certainly the, uh, the police were there. The governor called out the National Guard. You can see the picture there on the corner of Lake and State. Uh, where uh, both the Madison police and the National Guard were there to uh, to maintain an order that uh, that allowed demonstration, but uh, well, but were uh, there to ensure that it didn't that it didn't get out of hand. This grew and grew and grew until the spring, really, of uh, of 1970, when things erupted after the four students were killed at Kent State University in Ohio. There were great difficulties on campus, and again, the university didn't shut down but individual departments and schools and colleges decided how they were going to grade students, whether classes were going to continue or whether they were going to be shut down. Uh, it wasn't just the war. Uh, there were concerns uh, of a very social and political nature. We had had some tragedy in our country. Robert Kennedy was a candidate for president and he had just won the California primary and was, and was assassinated that, uh, that very day. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King was uh, was killed, uh, and uh, during a time when we were uh, when we were undergraduate students, that led to great uh, uh, difficulties within the country and on campus. Uh, it was it was a time when desegregation was being put forward in ways that were ineffective and black students were and everybody really was rightly upset about this the university was under great pressure to offer more black study black uh, black studies courses to offer a department of black studies uh, again students exercising their right to free speech and assembly would uh, would demonstrate on uh, on behalf of, of these programs and it was difficult to work towards your, your final semester, uh, towards your degree, when the campus was being, sh uh, some departments were being shut down, classes were being canceled, tear gas was flowing, and the National Guard and the, and the police were, uh, were on Bascom Hill and, and, and were in the, in the streets. Um, it was a change culturally, too, and there are parallels here. Uh, the every, every February 12th on, uh, Abe Lincoln's statue, somebody would put a, a little sign that said, happy birthday, A.B. Baby. Well, that was, a, that was a song right out of the Broadway play, Hair. Hair was a bellwether play for the social activity that was going on, the disruptions that were going on, the political concerns that were going on back in the, the time that I was an undergraduate student. And they are paralleled today, uh, 50 years later, by some of the same uh, some of the same themes have been presented in another bellwether Broadway play, Hancock. And so we see a tie-in between the between the 60s uh, and uh, the, the time when our students are are graduating in in 2020. The economy back then was was suffering. Uh, the war, the uh, 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 President Johnson's Great Society programs all cost money that the federal government didn't have. Uh, the government went into debt. Inflation was rampant. When we graduated from college, we were unsure about, number one, whether we were going to be drafted if we were young men, and then number two, Uh, I lost my screen there. Uh, and then number two, whether uh, we were going to be able to find a job. Uh, this is the, the situation that our students today find themselves in. What are they going to face when they graduate from, uh, from the university? Are they going to be able to find a job? Is there going to be an income for them? So while it's been 50 years, so many of the things that happened to us back then affected the way we led our lives from that point forward. The things that are happening to our students today are going to affect the way they lead their lives as they move forward. Mm -hmm. 
Keith, thank you. You know, I just, I really appreciate all of the parallels that you drew, not only about campus being disrupted, but across um, society, really so many of them. And I particularly was struck by your comparison between Hare and Hamilton. Um, I'd never even thought of that. And, and I think you're, you're right about that. It feels like this is a perfect time to bring in our two UW students now to hear their perspectives on campus life and tradition. And both of them are senior class officers. So I'm very pleased to introduce Lauren Sorensen, who is the president of the senior class. And Lauren, after she graduates on Saturday, plans to pursue her career in international relations. And then we also have Sonam Dolam, who is the senior class philanthropy director. And Sonam plans to attend medical school after graduating on Saturday. So welcome to both of you. Congratulations on your upcoming graduation. And Lauren, I would like to start with you if I could and just ask, how has this semester been for you? Thank you, Sarah. And thank you so much for having us once again. Um, I think it might be a little cliche, but it's definitely true. This is not how anyone anticipated this semester to go. I mean starting off on campus as a freshman, obviously you have a very clear idea in your mind of what that senior spring is going to be like, um, being with your friends, being on the terrace, sharing a pitcher of beer, all of those things that are just really integral to a Wisconsin experience have been taken away from us. Um, so yeah, this semester has been interesting. Obviously completing classes digitally has its challenges. Um, and as senior class officers, we really have just been trying to support seniors in every possible way through this challenging time. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And Sonam, I was struck by the fact that uh, you were you're going to pursue your medical degree. Tell us, has the COVID crisis had any influence on those plans? Hi, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so I would definitely say that the COVID crisis has, has only encouraged me to pursue my uh, career in medicine further. You know, it's really, this crisis has really let me have a genuine appreciation for healthcare workers. And I would say that in terms of logistics and applying to medical school, a lot of students, uh, including myself, had their MCAT exam canceled. So for those of you who don't know, MCAT is the medical college admission test. And so due to COVID-19, the those dates were canceled. So currently pre-med students all over the nation are scrambling to find an appropriate test date for this application cycle. Wow. Yeah, well, so. Good luck to you with all the other things that you're that you're facing right now. The senior class officers, as I understand it, are instrumental in planning commencement. And I'm sure that when the decision was made um, for safety of everybody due to COVID to move the commencement ceremony to be a virtual experience, I'm sure that a lot of planning had already taken place. Lauren, when you and the other class officers had had to pivot to a virtual experience, what were you thinking about and, and what things did you take into consideration about the ceremony? Yeah, so we found out pretty much at the exact same time everyone else found out. So we didn't have a lot of lead time to kind of come up with a plan. Um, but initially when we, you know, found out that the ceremony was going to be virtual, all of the officers kind of came up with a list of five things that were non-negotiable, things that we felt really had to be included in the ceremony in order to maintain the integrity of what a UW-Madison commencement is supposed to be. Um, obviously at the top of that list was jump around. That is, I think, ev one of everyone's favorite traditions. We ran into some difficulty with that, just obviously with ownership rights to the song. So we've had to be a little creative on how we're gonna incorporate that. And we're actually using the Facebook group and the radio stations that broadcast jump around every Saturday to give graduates the opportunity to participate in that. Yeah, and you know, it's nice being in a time with so much social media because now we're encouraging graduates to share their videos and we have platforms where we can kind of, you know, see other graduates and feel like we're together in a sense. So that was really important to us. Um, another tradition that we really wanted to maintain was varsity, obviously, another tradition that definitely brings tears to my eyes every time I sing it. And, you know, I think really illustrates the camaraderie of another commensal tradition, which is having an acapella group sing at the beginning of the ceremony. So the Mad Hatters actually arranged a varsity piece for us that will be played and it's incredible. It definitely captures just, I think music captures feeling in a way that not a lot of other things can. Um, so those were two things that were very important to us. And 
obviously we wanted to make sure that students had a voice in this. I mean, we were all speaking of what we wanted, um, but we did do a few surveys with the senior class just to really make sure that we were giving students the experience that they wanted. Because at the end of the day, it's about you know the students and we just wanna make sure that they're being heard through every step of this process. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing a little bit of, of the inside scoop with us on that. I'm so glad that, that you feel like you've achieved getting your must have traditions and how touching it is that some of the things that Jeff and Keith talked about varsity jump around uh, continue. Um, so thanks for that. Now, Sonam, as the, the philanthropy director, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what role philanthropy has um, in the traditions of the senior class? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so philanthropy plays an important role in the senior class by way of the annual senior class gift. And of course, supporting the university has been an established tradition in itself. And so as the philanthropy director, a large part of my role consists of developing senior campaign and, uh, st strategies and fundraising initiatives, as well as serving as the liaison between the senior class officers and the UW Foundation. Sonam, can you tell us what is the cause that the class of 2020 chose to support and how did you choose that? Yes, so the cause that we chose to support this year is the Green Bandana Project. And oh. so, yeah, so with the prevalence of mental health disorders across the nation and beyond, it became increasingly important to show our solidarity and try to remove the stigma behind it. And we felt that we felt that in order for each and every one of us to go forward and exemplify the Wisconsin idea, it's essential that Badgers are cultivating cultivating mental well-being. And so thus in an effort to provide awareness and education on mental illnesses and mental well-being, the 2020 senior class gift that we chose is a new fund to support the Green Bandana Project, which is organized by NAMI UW, which is short for the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And as you might all as you might know or not know, the Green Bandana Project was actually created by a former UW-Madison student and the Green Bandanas are actually now a widespread symbol, uh, symbol on campus. So they and the Green Bandanas indicate that the student carrying it is a safe and knowledgeable individual to approach about mental health issues and resources. And so participating students are educated on mental health related resources and they carry resource cards with them. And so we as a senior class office felt that the Green Bandana Project had far reaching impacts on campus. So we wanted to support NAMI's mission of promoting student well-being through advocacy and education. So our hope was that the class gift fund would allow NAMI to expand their outreach efforts. Uh, however, in, in light of COVID-19, we, we aren't actively seeking donations for our class fund uh, due to students facing certain financial um, issues, obviously. And so in collaboration with the university bookstore, we actually created the senior class, class of 2020, t-shirts where five dollars for each t-shirt purchase actually gets donated to the uh, student emergency support fund in order to help any students so yes that's currently where we're at in terms of funding that's terrific i've got to get myself one of those shirts so you said they're available at the bookstore right yep yep and, and i know that uh i know that online shop is working at the bookstore as well. So hopefully people can can support the cause and support the Green Bandana Project from the class. Seems like a very timely um, timely choice during during this stressful time. Sure. Um, so I want I wanted to uh, before we shift over to Q and A, I wanted to ask you: Are there any particular Badger traditions that really have resonated with you as a during your undergrad time? Yeah, I would definitely say the Wisconsin idea tradition has resonated with me the most because I believe that the Wisconsin idea really truly embodies and lays like the groundwork for global responsibility, which is something that I hope that all Badgers would um, strive for. So yes, for sure. Great. That, that, is, that is wonderful. And Lauren, um, what do you feel like will be the legacy of the class of 2020? So I think our legacy is honestly going to be resiliency. I mean, I know my fellow Badgers are really strong and we've gotten through a lot of things in the past. And just in light of the current circumstances, I know we are going to come out stronger than ever um, and bounce back and kind of come together as alumni to maybe come back to campus a little bit more and engage in some traditions after we graduate, just because we haven't been able to do that as graduating seniors. So definitely resiliency and carrying on just the great alumni tradition that this university has. 
Well, we certainly will look forward to having you back on campus when we when we can all be there together. That will be a really special time. Well, I would love to switch um, now to audience Q&A because I'm sure that people have some questions for all of you. And maybe if we have some time, you can ask some questions of Keith and Jeff too. But this first question is from Chris, um, who's, who says, I'm a 1968 grad and his mother and his aunts are grads as well. Um, let's see, they had a tradition back then of doing a Maypole dance on May 1st. Um, so his his grandparents graduated in 1917, and they had a tradition then of doing a maypole dance on May 1st on Bascom Hill. Um, Jeff, our expert, uh, do you know anything about that maypole dance? It was before your time, but uh, can you describe that tradition and why did it go away? Um, Can't imagine. <laughs> I you know I've seen pictures of it. I'm aware of it, uh, but uh, that's beyond my knowledge. I'll have, to, I'll have to look into that one a little bit more and find out exactly uh, what was the demise of the Maypole dance. But um, Maybe Bascom Hill was under construction and they couldn't put the poles up. <laughs> quite, quite possibly. <laughs> That's great. Well, um, thank you, Chris, for remembering, remembering that. And that, that's a great image. Um, this next question is from William. Let's see, I'm going to quickly skim it. Oh, he is rem not remembering, but he knows um, the story of how in the 1930s, the medical school was in <clears throat> Science Hall and cadavers were stored on the top floor. Students would break in on a Friday or Saturday night and send the cadavers down the fire escape. Keith, that sounds like your tradition. Is that <laughs> true? And is that why Science Hall is considered haunted? So hopefully, Keith, your your fun and games did not involve cadavers, but live people, it sounds like, right? Yeah, we, we almost became cadavers uh, when uh, when sliding down one too many times. But uh, I, you know, I've heard that too. And I, near as I've been able to find out, and Jeff, I don't know, maybe you've got some history with this. I. I don't think anybody ever did that with the cadavers, at least not that anybody was able to uh, to witness. There have been, uh, there have been um, claims that people have found parts of bodies stuck in the nooks and crannies of Science Hall. Uh, that's of course led to the, uh, the room that the place is haunted and hey why not uh, uh, what a better what, what there's not a better building on campus to be haunted than science hall that's true well I do know our colleagues um, who write for Wisconsin for on Wisconsin magazine and the Badger Insider have done some features on myths and legends on campus and really addressed is science hall really haunted so um, hopefully we can get a link to that in in the chat so people can read up on that and decide for themselves um, so Brian Frona wants to know who remembers Foshing and what was it? If mm -hmm. we can discuss that. I know that. Jeff remembers okay. Foshing. Yeah. Oh my God, uh, very well. Uh, so Foshing is the Austrian version of Mardi Gras. And uh, the Foshing celebrations on campus uh, were sponsored at both of the unions. and they would remove all of the furniture uh, in the Great Hall and in the Rathskeller, and they would have polka bands uh, in the Great Hall and rock bands down below. Um, some of the beer companies would bring in their, uh, their uh, uh, you know, vehicles and, and serve, serve beer right out of them. And uh, they had a shuttle that went back and forth between uh, Union South and uh, Memorial Union, and it was uh, just a big sort of music drinking festival on uh, the weekend before uh, Ash Wednesday. Wow, I, I had heard the term, I didn't know the <coughs> tradition, and it seems yeah. like students have been able to recreate, even though Fauching's not around anymore, it seems like that type of sentiment gets recreated. Oh, so I remember you would wear your worst clothes uh, to fashion <laughs> because there was an inevitably beer was going to be spilt all over the place. And I had a couple of my friends that said I didn't mention beer tonight. And so there we go. There you go. <laughs> Um, uh, good times. Well, uh, Jim, this question is from Jim. Why does the whistle blow during the evening on the terrace? I actually know the answer to this, but does anybody else want to take a stab at it? Well, I think it's the uh, uh, the whistle to bring uh, uh, to bring the boats in uh, the hoofers' boats in from the lake when uh, when mm -hmm. it's starting to get dark. Isn't it a, a, yeah. a safety issue? 
That's right. Exactly. I, I believe it's 30 minutes before sunset. Yeah. It, it blows in the evening then. It also um, is a weather alert when bad weather is coming. It will blow to let right. them. Right. But yeah, you're right. It is, uh, it, is, it is to get the boats in off the lake. Let's see. Um, uh, the next question is for Keith. Were you around during the time of the Sternoing Hall building bombing? And if so, what were your recollections about that? Yeah, I wasn't on campus then. Uh, that occurred in August, I believe, of mm -hmm. 1970. So, uh, mm -hmm. so I was gone. I was down school teaching in, in Beloit. But of, of course, we uh, we all knew about it. It was it was huge news. Uh, uh, that uh, around the country that this that this happened and that that uh, the young researcher was was killed. Uh, there, th I've got kind of a personal connection to that for in a very tangential way. My daughter was uh, subsequently years later a um, uh, a student at West High School, and two of her classmates were the uh, the, the daughters of the. Uh, of the student at the time who was uh, who was killed, uh, and they were the only two students I think that uh, have ever been given uh, free tuition and room and board for something other than uh, academic or, or, or other reasons having to do with with, with academics. The wow. the truck that was used to carry the explosive device was a uh, a Ford Econoline van, and it was owned by the woman who ended up being my daughter's English teacher. Uh, oh it, was stole, it was stolen from her, and it was used uh, by Carl Armstrong and the, mm. the other gentleman who, uh, who, who did the deed, and uh, it blew up and blew parts all over that part of town, but it belonged to my, uh, to my daughter's English teacher. Oh my gosh, wow, that is quite a connection. Um, there's a question coming in, and this is for Lauren and um, Sonam. What is the first thing that you will do on campus when the stay at home order is lifted to celebrate commencement? <laughs> um, Sonam, uh, what, Lauren, okay. go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think the first thing that comes to mind is definitely reuniting with all of my friends. Obviously, commencement is normally a big time of celebration, and you know, a lot of us are having to do that with our families, which is great, but you know, you miss your friends. So I think reuniting with my friends on the terrace, probably with a pitcher of beer, will be the first thing that probably many students do when they can. Sounds awesome. Sonam, how about you? Yeah, I would I would definitely see the same. And I think also getting to jump around at Camp Randall one more time with my cohort, that would be awesome. That would be awesome. Well, here here's hoping that that, that happens sometime soon. Mm -hmm. um, I wondered um, now, Lauren and Sonam, since you you have um, you're in the presence of a lot of Badger wisdom here and a lot of Badger history, um, Lauren, I'll ask you: Do you have any questions for either Keith or Jeff? Yeah, so I would love to ask Keith, maybe, and my peers, who a lot of us are very concerned about getting a job right now in this, you know, economy in light of the current situation, and you kind of spoke about that and going through that at your time as a graduate. So do you have any advice for the class of 2020 on how to kind of keep your head up and carry on the Badger legacy as we seek jobs? Well, you know, Lauren, I think you've already answered the question. You talked a moment ago about your resiliency and your ability to take things as they come. Um, none of us can predict the future, of course, but you can prepare for the un prepared and no generation of young students have ever had the unprepared thrust at them uh, as you folks have uh, have had. So the ability to stay loose, the ability not to perhaps get yourself too focused on specific plans that may not occur, the ability to use the wisdom that you've gained, the intelligence that you were born with, uh, use those in a way that got you through uh, successfully a very competitive university. Those, those abilities are gonna serve you very, very well as you move forward. Stay loose, try to be happy, try to look at the future as something that gives you an opportunity with a, a canvas that's very, very broad that you can make a mark on in many different ways. How's that for a metaphor? That's terrific. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and I, I would just add, lean into the Badger family. I mean, that's what we're there for. It's, there are a lot of resources at the Alumni Association that can help you do that uh, through our uh, 
our Badger Career Programs, uh, through our online programs, and through our local chapters. Uh, don't uh, don't uh, disregard that, and make sure that uh, you know you just keep in touch with your your alums. I, I graduated in 1982, and there was a downturn in the economy at that point in time, and people weren't getting jobs uh, then. So this is yeah, you know, I mean, as as Keith said, these are unprecedented times, uh, certainly. But uh, people have gone through that before and can really relate to you in that regard. So, so make sure that uh, you get on the Badger Bridge, that you uh, you know connect with our local chapter leaders, um, that you you know just connect with your classmates and and everyone else. And I think that's how a vast majority of us got our first jobs right out of school. Great advice. Sonam, did you have, have a question for either Keith or Jeff that you'd like to ask? Yeah, I would say, I was going to ask both uh, Keith and Jeff, what is the one aspect of being a Badger student that you miss the most? Mm -hmm. well, Jeff well, gets to keep living being a Badger student. <laughs> kind of do. <laughs> you know, I chose this career. I, uh, I miss everything. This didn't come up, but there, I, I have a history with the university. I'm now on the way out on the West Coast and the Olympic Peninsula of Washington, and I feel a long, long way from home. Uh, my relatives uh, uh, were part of that university for a long time. The Helen C. White building. Helen C. White was my cousin. Um, I've got, uh, my uncle was the dean of the law school. Uh, there are building, other building places on campus that were named for my relatives. And so I miss not being able to walk around on it. I miss not being able to be there and enjoy being part of what the university is. And so I would echo Jeff's mm -hmm. comment about staying in touch with, uh, with, with, your, uh, with your class, with others, and with the Badger community, and not forgetting about your time when you were college students, because it's a vital, valuable time when the world was opening up for you. Yeah. I Thanks, Keith. I was going to say something similar. I mean, as Sarah said, I am on campus, and it's one of the reasons I love what I do is that I get to be uh, involved with the uh, university in a very meaningful way and uh, be able to connect with my former classmates and alumni around the world. But um, you know, I, I think what that that opening up of things, uh, the the late nights uh, in the dorm rooms or in the fraternity house or in our uh, in our uh, Langdon Street apartment, uh, and have talk politics uh, with folks and have an intellectual conversation with uh, a bunch of people that thought very differently. I, I miss that that those days of uh, you know we are all just sort of uh, starting in on it and we respected each other's opinions and um, I kind of miss that. <laughs> Very poignant. I miss I miss just talking to people in person. <laughs> True. Um, um, Lauren and Sonam, the the final question is um, posed to each of you, and this question is from Ron. Uh, he gives a little context that says, in the '70s, and I think Keith will remember, some of the most distinguished professors were George Mossy and Harvey Goldberg. Oh, yes. uh, those names are very familiar. But Lauren and Sonam. Um, who would you say are the most popular and legendary professors right now? That is a hard question. Um, <laughs> I would say, I don't know if this was in the 70s, but I think now um, maybe more students come in with like AP credits and stuff like that so they can kind of specialize a little bit earlier. So I know that departments have kind of like famous professors, but it's hard to say if there's a professor who across the university is kind of well known. Um, but I'll say my two favorite professors, I guess, when I was in college, or perhaps um, the most distinguished of my professors were Professor Scott Strauss, who is with the political science department, and Professor Miernowski, who is with the French department. Wonderful. That's great. Sonam, how about you? Yeah, so I think it's hard to say the most popular professors across the whole campus, uh, but definitely within, I would say, departments and little niches on campus. Um, as a pre-med student, I know for a lot of students that take general chemistry their freshman year, I think Professor Paul Hooker is what popular professor for sure. Wow, thanks. Thanks. I, I hope that your faculty members um, hear or learn that you shared that about them. That's that's just terrific. 
Well, I want to uh, thank all of you for taking the time to be here tonight and to share your perspectives and your memories and your expertise. Um, I know that when Badgers are gathered together, we usually conclude every one of those meaningful gatherings by singing varsity. I believe a request was made to sing varsity, but I believe even our tremendous production team and the technology we have um, <laughs> just would not allow us to do justice to that fine tradition. So my recommendation to all the viewers would be uh, in your homes and where you are, put Varsity on after this program and give it a good sing for all of us. Mm -hmm. We will spare you um, this version of Varsity. We actually tried it as a staff and it was not pretty. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't good, but, but in our minds and hearts, we're singing Varsity right now. Um, I also want to acknowledge, you know, Saturday is a special day. It's a special day for our graduates. It's a milestone day. And while Jeff Wendorf will not be going through commencement, he will have his own milestone birthday. So all of you who are viewers who are who know Jeff, be sure on Saturday to wish him a special milestone birthday. Um, um, lots of decades are good, right, Jeff? Yep, send beer. <laughs> you can't say that. I know, so. Um, <laughs> so to everybody, thank you again for joining us. Our next UW Now live program will be Tuesday night at seven o'clock. We'll feature Mike Kenetter, president and CEO of the Wisconsin Foundation and Alumni Association. And he's going to be visiting with a couple of UW and alumni experts and discussing the economic consequences of COVID-19. I hope that you can all join us for that. And I want to close by congratulating the class of 1970 for achieving their half century mark. I hope that we get to see you all back on campus soon for your reunion celebration and a very, very special warm welcome to alumni hood for all of our graduating seniors in the class of 2020. We are here for you as a Badger Network. We know that you will do wonderful things mm -hmm. and, and we hope to see you back on campus as well. Thank you again for joining us tonight. We hope to see you next week for UW Now and on Wisconsin. Well done.